Dear students, let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 14th July 2016. I think it is 15th July 2016. The first article is related to Uniform Civil Code. For the last two days we have seen a series of articles related to Uniform Civil Code. Many of the articles argue that um, the Uniform Civil Code brings in gender justice and um, they also suggest that a legal action to bring a social change cannot be abrupt or cannot be sudden. It has to be progressively achieved. Or any changes in society and interaction of society and religion, it has to be slow and gradual. In this context, the present article tries to argue that to what extent uniform civil code is trying to bring in the gender justice. Now this article has some extreme tones, that's why I'm moderating it to bring it to relevance to our examination. What we are going to talk about here is this. Now, over a period of time, the judicial pronouncements and various laws passed by the parliament, it has brought in some kind of uniformity with regard to our civic life. If you talk about the woman and her role, the Domestic Violence Act, and then you have protection of the woman from Divorce Act for Muslim women, and inheritance rights for women from Hindu succession acts, all these things, an improvement over the past. So in this context, so if gender justice is not associated with the uniform civil code, then uniformity will bring in perpetuation of the patriarchy. So it means if the law do not explicitly protect the woman, the same law will be used to undermine their role, undermine their importance in the society. So uniform civil code, if not explicitly protecting the woman, then the law can become a tool for the promotion of patriarchy and also majoritarianism. That's why consultation and a gradualistic approach is required to bring in uniform civil code in the country. Now, you know that a sequence of political events have happened after Brexit. Mr. David Cameron, he has announced it to come down. And then Mr. Michael Gove, he showed his candidacy. And after that, surprisingly, Theresa May became the Prime Minister of UK. What are her chances? She is becoming the Prime Minister when the country was widely split. Her own conservative, that is stories, they themselves are split into centrist and rightist. And the consequences of David Cameron looking or pacifying the rightists has led ultimately to the Brexit. So unifying the party is the first thing. And the second thing is uh, unifying the people. The xenophobic sentiments are very strong in the UK as never before. Third is, uh, Tories have come to power promising the country uh, will be brought out of the existing economic crisis. But now the Brexit will worsen the economic situation. And finally, the worst scenario is this. She being from the Remain campaign has to bargain for the exit. It means the exit deal with the EU and the bargain is going to be a hard line for Miss May. And coming to control of crowds. So let us see this way. The rule that shall apply in controlling the crowds is restraint and minimal use of force if necessary. And to the possible extent protection of valuable life. So in this context, many of the countries they use these pellets non-lethal pellets um, to disperse the crowds, to m prohibit them moving forward. But uh, all the police who use these pellets, they are trained to fire them below the knees. Unlike this, um, the firing them onto the face, it has kept many of the Kashmiris going blind. So it is, um, I mean, it is a lethal way of using a non-lethal weapon, which is making these young people go blind. So in this context, um, the humanitarian way of managing the crowd is very critical for the country. And then, the Kashmiris. So, United States, it wants to have a dialogic approach to solve the Kashmiri problem. And it has called for the dialogue between the India and Pakistan. And India has accused the Pakistan for its state-sponsored terrorism. And Pakistan has raised the Kashmiri issue in the United Nations again as to the spirit of the Shimla conference. And coming to the free trade agreements, India's free trade agreements are not moving forward with any of the country, EU, Australia, or with regard to regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement. So where the problem is? 
So in this interview with Nirmala Sitaraman, what she says is, um, yes, the free trade agreements and the crisis what we are seeing now, it is in general with what is happening in the world now. The economic slowdown, the Brazil and Russia's economy being contracting out. And then uh, we have a situation where India has to gain out of this particular contract, not shall be a net loser out of it. So that's why there is a general slowdown in FTA talks across the world and India is not an exception to it. And the second thing is, um, India is pushing for its services export in Layu for goods import uh, to maintain a trade balance. So which is also been uh, seen as India as an obstructor in RCEP that is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And finally, a WTO and uh, India's role is said to be uh, demanding for a more level playing field between developed and developing countries. On bilateral investment treaty, and with regard to investor-state agreement um, or conflict, what she says is this. Um, investors cannot pull the sovereign nation into a conflict um, to make up for their losses because recently Kane Energy has filed a suit for $5 billion against government of India. So in this investor-state dispute, um, India wanted to revise its uh, bilateral investment treaty with different countries. And next is... Arunachal crisis. So after Supreme Court has uh, uh, adjudged for ante situation as like in the past. So uh, that is status quo ante. What has happened is now the governor has given the Nabam Tuki, the, prior, the chief minister who is reinstated uh, till July 16th to prove his majority on the floor of the house. So again, here there are certain constitutional questions. Now Supreme Court has said status quo ante. It means before the president's rule, how the status was, it has to be restored. So, before the president's rule, the speaker was also removed from the office by the special session on the orders of the governor. It means now, Mr. Nabam Rebia, the speaker, can he hold the session or not is a question. If he is not qualified to hold the session, then who has to conduct the session? These are the legal questions that are pending. And then, on South China Sea, you know that permanent court of arbitration at Hague. It has given its judgment against China and there is no legal basis for the historical claims of China over South China Sea. And it clearly said that uh, the China is entering into the exclusive economic zones of Philippines. So India, if you take its stance, um, it is looking for uh, the freedom of navigation on high seas and overflight uh, and fear the freedom of overflight. So in this context, what has been said is... Uh, China is saying India is on its side with regard to this argument, but India has clearly said that it, wa it is supporting for the freedom of navigation and free flight. And the second thing is, the China is quoting the Russia-India-China conference happened in Moscow where the Sushma Swaraj has signed common stand of all three countries. But the India said the diplomacy is all about reading between the lines. So the general principle will not drive the diplomacy as India supporting the China. And come expanding the idea of India. This is by Justice Kurian Joseph. He talks about expanding the fundamental duties in the country. You know that fundamental rights are enforceable but not the fundamental duties. But they provide for a kind of a sense of a responsibility to the citizens. But they are not legally enforceable in spite of this. What the Justice Kurian Joseph says is, India has to bring in new sets of duties to balance the growing rights due to interpretation of the Article 21 by the Constitution. So in these circumstances, he demands for duty to vote, duty to pay taxes, and then duty to help accident victims. So these are the three things. Now if you see clearly, uh, and duty to keep premises clean, these are the four things. Sorry, Swachh Bharat. So these are the four things. Um, they shall not lead to uh, vigilantism by certain groups um, in the country. So in this case, but it's a general idea how the duties have to be for the citizens, um, which have to bring in a reinvigorated sense of civic responsibility. And then duty to prevent civil wrongs, duty to raise voice against injustice, duty to protect civil whistleblowers, duty to support bona fide civil society movements. These are the other things which is said to create a just and better society. So these are the articles for today. Thank you very much.